God be praised and be worshipped. Pray these things in your name, the people said. Amen. You may be seated. Please, have a seat. I think there's a car race on. Is there a car race on at the moment? Or is that just Norwood life? Just Norwood life? Car race. Car race. Gotcha. Cool. Hey, we're in John 10 this morning, so please open up to it uh, in your Bibles. There's probably a Bible near you. Um, if there is not a Bible near you, just jump on your phone. You can look up the passage on your phone. I think it's on page 842 on the passage that's on your chair. Um, and if it's not, then you just kind of have to find your own way to it. So we're in John chapter 10. Um, if you don't own a Bible and you've grabbed one of ours, that's our gift to you. So please just take it, take it with you, take it home. We would love to be able to give you that gift. I um, also just want to let you know that, I should have mentioned this before, if you're a person that's in need of food, or you're a person that knows someone who's in need of food, every Monday at 2 o'clock, um, we have built a relationship with two organisations, Hands and Feet and Audi, to provide free food to people, free groceries, no questions asked. And so if that's you or someone you know, please join us tomorrow at 2 o'clock. We'd love to be able to serve you and, and help you in that way. Um, so we're in John 10 this morning. <clears throat> While you're looking that up, I want to tell you about a sheep named Barak, Right? Um, this sheep at one point in time was doing really well, right? This sheep was um, in the sheepfold. It was flourishing under the guidance and the leadership and the care of a shepherd. But then during the COVID lockdown got out. I don't know that they're related. It might be related. Might have, couldn't have handled the lockdown and got out. But during that time, got out. Now, this sheep had been trained for every year. It would grow, this, grow the wool, and then a shepherd would come along and would, sh- would, she- would shear? Shear. shear, bang, love it, would shear the sheep and would take that wool. Uh, but when the sheep left the sheepfold, there was no one there to care for it. And so after who knows how long, this sheep grew 35 kilos of, she- of uh, wool around, around its body, and it was in danger, Right? Under the care of the shepherd, everything was good. Outside of the care of the shepherd was not able to receive food or water, for it could not get its own food and water. It could not move, and it was easy prey for predators. Outside of the care of the shepherd. Eventually, this sheep rock was found, and it was returned to those who would care for it, and it was looked after well. It was cared for, and it was able to flourish. Now, this is what Scripture says about God and says about God's people. The psalmist writes, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture, right? God's people flourish with the shepherd, right? And outside of the care of the shepherd, we're in trouble. Um, I heard a pastor use this illustration and he said, which is so true, we are more like sheep than we care to admit, right? Desperately in need of the resources that the shepherd can provide. Now, we're in a series looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus throughout, found throughout the Gospel of John. And as we come to John 10, Jesus, one of the beautiful things about this series is in the lead up to Christmas, we are coming to Jesus and we're allowing him to define who he is, right? That many people will tell you what they think about Jesus, who they think he is. But in this series, Jesus says, I am. And he gets to define himself. And today we're looking at his words where he says, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. And we need a good shepherd, amen? We need a shepherd who is good to the sheep for we are utterly dependent upon him. Now, in what way is he the good shepherd? Well, this morning we're going to see in this text in four different ways. We'll see the concern of the shepherd. We'll see the call of the shepherd, the character of the shepherd, and then the invitation of the shepherd. So firstly, let's start with the concern of the shepherd. In this series... It's a little different from what we've normally done. Normally, we've walked line by line through a book of the Bible, but in our challenge that we've given ourselves to um, understand these statements of Jesus, we've had to skip chapters at a time to be able to accomplish our task, which is normally okay, except the chapter that we're in now, chapter 10, is built on chapter 9, right? All this action happens in chapter 9, and then chapter 10 is the response to that situation. 
And so what happens in chapter 9? In chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who has been blind from birth and the Pharisees are outraged, right? Which is a tragedy, but also completely consistent with their behavior at the time of Jesus. That the shepherds were supposed to be God's people looking after God's people and tending to them. But when this man is miraculously healed by Jesus, this is the response of the Pharisees. They kick him out of the temple, which to him means he's been removed from the worshipping life of God's people. This was the normal, predictable behavior of the Pharisees at that time, right? And so Jesus has this encounter with the Pharisees and he turns to them and he gives them this analogy. It is a story that is used to be able to elicit deeper meanings. And so with that in mind, let's turn to verse 1. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, to the Adelaidean, that can be a hard illustration to initially grip onto. But to a first century Jewish leader, this makes the world of sense. Now, why is that? Because um, since the book of Genesis, God and the leaders of God's people have been referred to as shepherds. Right, And so um, Jacob is on his deathbed and he worships the Lord by saying this, God has been my shepherd all my life to this day. And then you get to the book of Jeremiah and you have God's leaders acting in a horrible way. And so the prophet Jeremiah comes along and says of God's leaders, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. And in response to this, the prophet says, And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, it's very likely that the Pharisees in John 10 would think of themselves as this gift from Jeremiah, that the Pharisees saw themselves as the shepherds of God's people, but Jesus does not see them this way. Jesus sees them as thieves and robbers, men who are coming to steal, Steal sheep from the pasture that belongs to God. Now, the great tragedy is that um, prior to Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, and in our day today, we have thieves and robbers, those who are seeking to influence God's people away from the sheepfold to this day. Now, how is it possible that something like that can happen, particularly in the gathering of God's people? Well, here's one way. This is a verse taken from 1 Chronicles 16.22 and Psalm 105 verse 15. And it is a phrase used by a number of people in different churches to justify pastors acting without accountability. Listen to these words. Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. They'll rephrase it and some of you might have heard this before. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. That statement in many churches has become a real problem, right? It's used as a um, get out of jail free card for the leaders of God's people to do whatever they want and to act without accountability. That's a problem, right? Many churches, in this, particularly in the States, have allowed their pastors to preach sermons divorced of the gospel to take salaries that are reflective of the salaries of CEOs, to um, uh, not hold themselves to the kind of accountability that they're holding their own people to under this banner of do not touch the Lord's anointed. That's a Bible verse though, right? And so what are you supposed to do with that text? Well, you're supposed to understand it in its context. Any verse that you take outside of its context and wield as a weapon can be deeply problematic. When those lines were written, Israel is at war with other nations who are coming, this is faithful Israel, coming in to take God's people into these foreign lands. And God was so wonderful to protect God's leaders that the people praised the Lord and in these Psalms sung songs that said, 
touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm, because God cared for his faithful leaders. It is not a get out of jail free card. Now, the problem is, is that through the centuries, there has always been people who have tried to influence people away from the true family of God. Always happened, right? And so the question emerges that we should be focusing on here, that John's gospel focuses on, is this question. How will anyone be saved when there is so much opposition to God's plan? How will anyone come to true salvation when there are what Jesus describes, thieves and robbers constantly out influencing people away from the sheepfold? How will anyone come to know God? It's a good question. It's a question that John's gospel engages with well. So we have the concern of the shepherd over these thieves and robbers. And now we see the call of the shepherd. Look down at verse 2. He writes, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, one of the most iconic Australian pictures that we have is of sheep out in the countryside and you've got a sheepdog behind the sheep um, kind of nipping at their heels, pulling them into line, right? In Australia, that's how the farmer directs the sheep. With these sheep, with these sheepdogs behind the sheep, nipping at their heels, Fear is motivating the sheep. Middle Eastern farmers don't work that way, right? Middle Eastern shepherds don't work that way. It didn't work that way in Jesus' day and it doesn't work that way today. If you were to be in the Middle East today and you were to look upon a farmer, you wouldn't see the shepherd behind the sheep. You would see the shepherd in front of the sheep calling them by name and the sheep respond. That is the image that we receive of a God who goes before his people and calls them by name and the sheep respond. So how is it possible for God's plan of redemption to work out if there are so many other voices in the lives of the sheep? Well, here is the mysterious and the glorious answer that scripture gives us. The sheep will know the true voice of the shepherd, and they will come running. You may have heard people teach on this passage before, and their application for this text is that you need to learn to hear the voice of God, right? This text is used to give you work to do, right? Now, while Scripture does teach us that we need to be people of the Word, that is the Word of Christ, and we need to study it, this scripture that is teaching God's people about salvation does not describe any work that the believer needs to do. This is describing the behavior of the shepherd who calls out to his sheep and they know his voice and they come running. Jesus is speaking about how it is possible to come to the true shepherd when thieves and robbers abound. The answer, his voice will be unmistakable. And his call will compel to the uttermost. This is a profound and beautiful truth. Those children of God that God chooses to save, nothing will get in the way of the call of Christ. Nothing will get in the way. Now, how are we to understand what theologians describe as the effectual call of Christ? Meaning, God's sovereign drawing of a sinner to salvation. Now we're in theological deep waters this morning, right? Theological deep waters. Someone said to me a couple of weeks ago when we started this topical series that they were disappointed that we were doing a topical series and not going through books of the Bible because they like us going line by line through the text. And I totally agree. We'll be in it for a while and then we'll go back to books of the Bible. But as we come to understand these seven I am statements of Jesus, we are studying them in their context, right? 
And the context that this scripture gives us is that we must deal with a shepherd who calls and his sheep who will definitely come. How are we to understand what theologians call the effectual call of Christ? Well, in multiple places in scripture, we read that the names of believers have been written in the book of life, right? The record book of salvation. So the natural question to ask then is when were the names written? Is the book of life being filled up with names like a university course where once a person signs up to the course, then their name is added? Or is the book of life pre-filled? Well, in Revelation 13, the Apostle John receives a vision from the Lord of the end of the world and the coming Antichrist. Theological deep waters that we're in this morning, right? Receives this vision of the Antichrist who will work to drag away worship from Jesus. And this is what it says in verse 8. It says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life. The testimony of Scripture is this. God has chosen to glorify himself by electing those whom he would save. So if you're a believer, your name has been written in the book of life before the foundations of the world were established. And God's ability to save those whom he has predestined to be saved is entirely secure. No one can pluck you from the Father's hand. Once you have been called a child, you are a child of God, indwelt by the Spirit of God, nothing and no one, no influencing force will be able to rip you from his hand. Um, My wife spends a lot of time at different schools uh, running into school sports carnivals. And this one time, um, she didn't check the weather report, she went out to the carnival. And the weather was terrible, she had no food, no jacket, 10 a.m., her shoes and socks are filled with water. So she sends me a message and says, can you bring me stuff? I grab the stuff, head to the school. Hundreds of students, um, heaps of teachers, heaps of adults. How am I going to find Beck? The answer to that is easily because I know her. I know the way she walks. I know the way that she speaks. I have complete confidence in a crowd of people that I would be able to pick Beck's voice out and move towards her. And I know that for many of people in this room, you've got people in your life that when they speak, you know their voice and you will step towards it. Now, the difference between my relationship with Beck and our relationship with God is that I have learned Beck's voice. But that's not what the scripture says here. The scripture says that there is no work for you to do. Scripture says, this is Ephesians 2 verse 8, says salvation is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is made possible because it is a gift to the believer. You did not work for it. Now, if you've been in a Bible-believing church for any length of time, I have no doubt that you've been in a discipleship group setting or a small group setting where you've been in this debate until the wee hours of the morning right? Into the evening, into the wee hours of the morning debating this. And generally the debate has got two sides. One side says God is sovereign in that he predestines those he foreknew would choose him. The other side will argue that God has foreknowledge because he planned everything, right? And into the wee hours of the morning that we go. Now, I don't discourage these kinds of debates, but what I, want you to know, what I want you to see in Scripture is that every single passage that you go to that speaks about the sovereignty of God's salvation, the work that he does in the believer's life, there is no tension in the Scripture. Every single passage is calling you to worship. And we get stuck in debate. Stuck in debate. Let us not be like the man who stands in front of the Grand Canyon and spends all of his time arguing, is this a canyon or is this a series of valleys, right? The point of the Grand Canyon as we stand in front of it is to say, oh my goodness, right? 
The purpose for those, whether we stand on either side of the camp, both of us believe in the sovereignty of God to work in the believer's life, uh, believing in the effectual call of Christ. That when the shepherd calls his sheep, we will come running. That's how good our shepherd is. Our shepherd is the one who does the work, not the sheep. He's that good. He's that kind. And he's that worthy of not just your debate, but he's worthy of your worship. So we see the concern of the shepherd. We see the call of the shepherd. Now let's consider the character of the shepherd, the character of the shepherd. Uh, Look down at verse 6. John writes, This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Um, What appears to uh, obvious to the reader has stumped the Pharisees. Whether they don't understand because of pride or they're just clueless, we're not really sure. Um, But what we are sure of is that this text is about to reveal something quite profound about the character of our shepherd. So look down at verse 7. It says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, if you're observing the text carefully, you might be a little bit confused at this point. Because previously we were saying that Jesus is the shepherd and now we're saying Jesus is the door. And so which one is it, right? If you look down at verse 11, it says it quite clearly. Jesus speaks, I am the good shepherd. So do we have a confused Jesus? Is Jesus confused about whether he's the door or whether he's the shepherd? Well, again, an understanding of Middle Eastern shepherding helps us this morning, right? Now, shepherds in the Middle East, the way that they would care for their flock is that they would either find a cave that's pictured up here and they would um, keep their sheep in the nook of that cave or what they would do is they would get a whole bunch of rocks and they would build a shelter, build walls so high that sheep couldn't jump out, predators couldn't jump in. Regardless of the way that the Middle Eastern people built the walls, the door was always the same. There was none. For the shepherd became the door. The shepherd would lay down his own body to be the door so that no one could get out and no one could get in without his knowing. So what does that reveal about the good shepherd? It means that he is both the means of our salvation and he is the protector of our salvation. That God is so good that he saves us and he is so good that he secures our salvation so that nothing can snatch us out of the Father's hand. Nothing can get in the way of God's love for us. Um, the, there's this um, scene in uh, the Superman movie where Superman flies up a building, building's burning, grabs a man, comes out of the burning building. And the man's up really high. And he gets fearful that he's going to get dropped from that great height. And Superman says this, Now, if I delivered you from the burning fire, what makes you think I'm going to drop you when I'm carrying you to safety, right? What does this text reveal about the character of the good shepherd? Jesus does not just save sinners just to have them lost to another evil, right? Those whom Jesus saves, he secures their salvation. So good is the shepherd that thieves and robbers will be in the world, that will, they'll try to drag you away from the family of God. But once you are saved, you are always saved, always secure in his family. Jesus seals your salvation with the Spirit of God, securing your salvation. Scripture says in Philippians that day by day, he is conforming you to the image of Christ. Paul says in Colossians that you are a new creation. Jesus doesn't do this great work in you of making you a new creation, conforming you to his image, giving you the spirit to see you walk away from the family. No, he's doing all those things to draw you near. What you need to see through this this text about Jesus being the good shepherd is please notice all the work that the sheep are not doing. 
and all the work that the good shepherd is doing to save you, to secure you, to protect you, to love you forevermore. This is the character of the good shepherd, the door, the one who protects. The good news doesn't stop there. Look down in verse 10. Uh, John writes, and the words of Jesus, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And salvation doesn't just mean that you've reserved your seed in heaven. Life in abundance starts immediately. One of the major themes in John's gospel is to get God's people to understand that the abundant life begins the second you start walking with Jesus. Not, doesn't, it's not just about heaven. Heaven is a beautiful reality for the Christian. We should all look forward to it. We should all desire it. But the moment you come into right relationship with Jesus, you are indwelt with the Spirit and that walk has already begun for you. The abundant life begins instantaneously. And um, how do we know this? We know it because it is the constant echo of Scripture. We also know it because Christianity is not a religion where you spend your life trying to pay off the debt of your bad works. Christianity is not a religion where you come into it and you spend the rest of your days trying to work off all the bad that you have done. No, Jesus made himself the perfect substitute for you. That's why when you come into right relationship with him, the debt has already been paid so your new life can begin. That's what our text says. Look down at verse 11. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves. He leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Then Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Christ is the good shepherd who lays down his life for you so the abundant life can begin. This is the grace of our Saviour. This is the goodness of the shepherd, the one who lays down his life for you. When you become a Christian, you are instantly indwelt by the Spirit of God. You are instantly adopted into the family of God and the Father calls you his child and you are able to call the creator of the universe your Father. Scripture giving you these intimate words so that you would know how closely you are connected and secured to him. You are instantly at peace with God. He is no longer holding your sins against you. You are walking in grace and walking in forgiveness. And profoundly, you're instantly able to draw near to God in prayer. It should daily bring you to your knees in reverence that our God would delight to hear your prayers. Where other people get sick of our moaning, get sick of our complaining, and they don't want to hear it anymore, Scripture says, pray unceasingly. Always draw near to him. How is it possible? Because we have the good shepherd who substituted himself so that we could have life with Jesus forevermore. This is what Jesus is revealing about the abundant life, given as a precious gift to his sheep. Um, next, Jesus goes on to describe his relationship with his father. And John closes this section with a contrasting response to Jesus' words that are rightly seen as an invitation to respond. Look down at verse 19. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words that Jesus has spoken. Many of them said, he is a demon and is insane, why well, listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who was oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Uh, let me point this out to, in closing this morning. 
There are two truths presented side by side in Scripture worth noting. God's sovereignty and salvation and the responsibility of humanity to respond. John, throughout his gospel, constantly points out this division in response so the reader would be drawn in to make a decision. You have been invited. You have been invited to be one of the sheep of Christ, for him to be your good shepherd. A theology of God's sovereignty and salvation doesn't bring about apathy. It's a call to draw near to him in worship. The child of God sees the sovereignty of God's salvation and says, oh my goodness, let me worship him. Let me delight in the Father's good work and draws near to the good shepherd. That's who he is. Um, as I was preparing this, I couldn't help but been reminded of the time I went to a, a fringe show a number of years ago. You've probably had the same expectation where you have high expectations going into the fringe show and often, not always, you end up a little bit disappointed with what you got, right? The invitation to, to, to draw near to the Good Shepherd never results in his people being disappointed. The truth is that we receive more than we could imagine. That's what Ephesians 3.20 says, God's people receiving more than we could think or imagine. For those who come into the sheepfold, you are secured eternally into an eternal relationship with Father and the right response, the only right response that John calls for that I'm pleading with you to make is would you respond to the Good Shepherd in worship this morning? Let's pray together.